Greetings one and all, Super Wednesdays here in the Holy Land, Holy Apple, Holy Hilltop, coming to you, second day of the new month of Tammuz. And before we start <coughs> our part three of this important series, first of all, always a thank you to all those volunteers. Everything here is volunteer folks from the camera people, from the cars, from picking up, you name it, everything's volunteer. So we thank all those that participate in the in this project of coming to you and hopefully bringing messages of truth to one and all. So now we take anybody, you know, we just finished the series of do black lives matter? Do Jewish lives matter? Be a man, make Aliyah now, M-A-N. And it's very important, share it. Get it out, get the message out. A lot of these messages are very important that not a few hundred people here, but, a few, but thousands of people here. And at least us, we're very humble here. We don't have that those opportunities, but maybe somebody out there listening, watching, you do have that opportunity. So, whatever it takes, I don't even know the language, share, social media, whatever it has, whatever it has to be done, do it. Okay, today we have our class title, the Battle of Armageddon 2020. Scary. This is part three of our series. And like always, you don't have to be nervous. I didn't see the first part. I didn't see the second part. It don't matter. I mean, it matters. But it ain't the, it ain't the end of the world. So we always have a summary of what we've done. So let us start. <clears throat> Let us begin our journey. Okay, first two classes, summary. When the world was created, there was an original light of the world. This light, we would translate to be a light of knowledge, secrets of the universe, nature, wisdom. Does this light still exist? Yes. Even though God removed this light after a short period of time at the creation of the world, it still exists for individuals or communities to tap in. We are told in our Torah sources there will be three world wars against God and against His appointed or anointed one. First battle, First World War, was the battle of Nimrod against Abraham and God. Second battle royal, Second World War, was God, Joshua, against the six Canaanite nations who lived here in the land of Israel. And last, not, last but not least, it hasn't occurred yet, the Third World War, according to our Torah sources, will be the end of days war, Gog Magog, Armageddon, same thing, against God, against Messiah. <clears throat> we are also told, very interesting, that San Kharif, who exiled the Ten tribes from Samaria. He also participated in three wars against Jerusalem, God, and Israel. Last but not least, also the evil king of Babylonia, Nebuchadnezzar. Sancharib was the king of Assyria. He also 
fought three wars, the number again three, against God, Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish people. When, when, our, when our Torah sources tell us there are three world wars, what does that really mean? It means that these are three transitional periods of history. These are three, period of, three periods of time that history will never look the same. How does this occur? Opposites attract. You have two forces, as we saw, for example, you have Abraham and God, Nimrod and his nation, two opposites, attract. They must, okay, they must eliminate one another, one or the other. So, there are three such periods of time. Today, we are on the cusp of such a time, such a transitional period of history. We are right on the threshold. A loop in the chain of wars. We said three world wars, world wars. However, there's a loop here. Number one, the first loop was in this battle against God, Jerusalem, and Israel, welcome king of Syria, Sancharib. He was a reincarnation of Nimrod, who the First World War. So it's really the same, but it's a loop. Section A. Next, Nebuchadnezzar. He also is, was a reincarnation of Nimrod. That's our second loop. The last loop is the war of Armageddon, Gog and Magog. This Gog and Magog is a reincarnation of Nimrod, Sancharib, and Nebuchadnezzar all in a battle against Israel, God, Jerusalem, the Temple, Messiah. We spoke about the Tower of Babel. We brought eight amazing points in the first two classes that what was the essence of this Tower? What was special about it? Why did God have to put it to an end? What was the big deal? We saw amazing sources that show us that this was the highest of techs, the high tech, highest of technology. It was sophisticated, amazing. Last but not least, we saw in the first two classes, we saw the unbelievable commentaries of Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch and the Abar Vanel. First, a quick summary of the Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch. Number one, the generation of the Tower of Babel, they left nature, <clears throat> they left God's creation. They wanted only man-made inventions. Three, their idea was to replace God and control the individuals. Four, they utilized the masses until the masses were no longer needed, obsolete. They now controlled nature and the world People no longer mattered. 
technology did. That is the Rav Shimshon file hers. Next. <clears throat> Before we go on, here we will stop for an unbelievable Rod Sterling clip. Unbelievable. Who knows how many 50, 60 years ago this was made? How apropos. It is like the message is for us, for our generation. Let's check it out. You walk into this room at your own risk, because it leads to the future. Not a future that will be, but one that might be. This is not a new world. It is simply an extension of what began in the old one. It has patterned itself after every dictator who has ever planted the ripping imprint of a boot on the pages of history since the beginning of time. It has refinements, technological advances, and a more sophisticated approach to the destruction of human freedom. But like every one of the super states that preceded it, it has one iron rule. Logic is an enemy and truth is a menace. This is Mr. Romney Wordsworth. In his last 48 hours on Earth, he's a citizen of the state, but will soon have to be eliminated. Because he's built out of flesh, and because he has a mind. You've been under investigation, Mr. Wordsworth, for the mandatory period of one year and 11 months. You are found to be obsolete. The purpose of this hearing is to make a finding in the matter and make a sentence accordingly. Do you understand that, Mr. Wordsworth? Your occupation, Mr. Wordsworth? A librarian. A librarian. Having to do with books. Yes, sir? Books. Since there are no more books, Mr. Wordsworth, there are no more libraries. The field investigators in your sector have classified you as obsolete. Your rights are as follows, Mr. Wordsworth. You are to be liquidated within a period of 48 hours. You are obsolete, Mr. Wordsworth. A lie! No man is obsolete! You have no function, Mr. Wordsworth. You're an anachronism, like a ghost from another time. I am nothing more than a reminder to you that you cannot destroy truth by burning pages. You're a bug, Mr. Wordsworth, a crawling insect, an ugly, misformed little creature who has no purpose here, no meaning. I am a human being. Delusions, Mr. Wordsworth, delusions that you inject into your veins with printer's ink, the narcotics that you call literature, poetry, essays of all kind, all of it, an opiate. You have nothing but spindly limbs and a dream, and the state has no use for your kind. I don't care. I tell you, I don't care. I'm a human being. I exist. And if I speak one thought aloud, that thought lives, even after I'm shoveled into my grave. The Chancellor, the late Chancellor, was only partly correct. He was obsolete. But so is the state, the entity he worshipped. Any state, any entity, any ideology that fails to recognize the worth, the dignity, the rights of man, that state is obsolete. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Abar Vanel, number one, summary. God created a world with resources that would allow him to live a spiritual life, a life to perfect one's character traits and live in tranquility. Like so many individuals or, or generations, the Tower generation preferred progress and technology. They left 
their tra tranquil, simplistic life of rural communities for the urban, high-tech, and glamour, glitz society. Urbanization led to the all the big major sins in the rat race to get ahead. Robbery, lust, murder, jealousy, etc. All these new man-made inventions rev removed mankind from the purpose of God's creation, which was created us to be spiritual, perfect our character, pray, relation with God, and loving our fellow men. We have here an amazing activist from India. Let's check out her important words. Take it away. Hello and welcome to the Friends 24 interview. My guest today is Vandana Shiva. She is a world famous environmental activist from India. She's a laureate of the alternative. Nobel Prize in 1993. She's author of numerous books. Her latest is called Oneness versus 1%. One Thank you very much for being on the phone. My podcast. pleasure. I want to begin uh, early on. You were not uh, supposed to be an activist. Uh, you were a physicist. You wanted to work in nuclear energy. And then uh, you came across in the early 1970s what is known in India as the Shipko movement. Can you explain us how you came across? Yeah. Yes, I was training to be in India's nuclear establishment. But then my sister woke me up to the hazards of nuclear. She was a medical doctor. And I went deeper into theoretical physics. I was going to Canada to do a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And before I went, I wanted to visit some of my favorite forests in the Himalaya. I've grown up in the Himalayan forests. And this forest I had trekked in was gone. The stream that came from this oak forest was gone. And while returning to Delhi, I talked to a tea shop owner and he talked about how there's a new movement called Chipko. So in my heart, I said, I'm going to come back every vacation and be a volunteer for this movement. Women came out to say, we're going to hug the trees. You cannot cut the trees because from the trees come our water. The trees stabilize the mountain and prevent landslides. The trees prevent floods and droughts, and they also give us everything we need. We will be huggers of trees. The name Chipko means to hug. And I learned all my lessons of ecological activism from the women of the Himalaya who had never been to school but knew everything about ecology, knew everything about biodiversity. What they called soil, water, and pure air today talked about as ecological functions of the forests that forests are not timber mines. And a lot of my change in the understanding of the fact that nature is the basis of economy came from my engagement with Chipko. My respect for women's knowledge, indigenous knowledge, came from my engagement with Chipko. And it totally turned my own head upside down because of physics, you know, high in the world, you know something others don't. And you re I realized everyone has knowledge and right. you must respect it. Okay, <clears throat> that was class number one and class number two. Let's go further. Today, with God's help, we will bring ten new points regarding the tower and Nimrod, King Nimrod, in order for us to better understand this battle, this final end of days battle, how it is so prevalent, we see it right in front of our very eyes happening. We just don't associate it to Armageddon. We always think of Armageddon as, you know, ammunition, tanks, airplanes. That definitely can be. But there are different faces of this war. And what we're discussing in this series is a very important 
face and to understand where the enemy is coming from. Okay, folks, listen, really put on a seatbelt. You can't make any of this stuff up. I really, I was really amazed when I saw this stuff. So put on those seatbelts. Number one, batting first, is Rabbeinu Bachia. He has a commentary on the Torah. He passed away in the year 1340. So he writes in his commentary on the Torah, and once again, whenever I'm giving a source, and I won't say exactly where it is, know that we're talking about the portion of Noah, and we're talking about the, uh, the 11th chapter. Okay, when we're talking about the, the generation of Babel, so there's about nine verses that discuss this, so that's where we're at. What does Rabbeinu, a Rabbi Bachia, say? It says that the generation of the tower, they were very frightened. They knew that God would not send a flood to destroy the world, but they had privy information that the next flood wasn't going to be water, it was going to be fire. A flood of fire was going to destroy at least, at least parts of the world. So what did they do? Amazing. They invented, according to Rabbeinu Bachia, this is amazing, he passed away 700 years ago, folks. And he writes that they built this tower and it was really the first lightning rod ever built in order to stop this fire from the heavens. That's really amazing. So, if you thought that Benjamin Franklin, now Benjamin Franklin, he is known as the person that invented the lightning rod, the first lightning rod, in uh, the year 1760, passed away 30 years later. The first lightning rod. That was the idea. This tower, you know, today, you go in Israel, I'm sure in other places in the world, you see these like, you know, these big, these tall uh, poles, and on top they have these light ro lightning rods that stop. Uh, you know, it's far more advanced today, but if there's any lightning bolts coming down, so this picks it up and um, moves it below the ground, so it does not uh, destroy anything. So it's amazing. So that was the tower. The tower was to stop the, the upcoming, what they believed was going to be the next flood to destroy the world or part of the world via um, fire. Believe it or not, this invention of the lightning rod was not, as we said, it was in the time of Nimrod time of the tower, but also if you look up in Tosefta, the Tractate of Shabbat, in the seventh chapter, and look in the tenth paragraph, you will see this Tosefta we have in our sources. Two thousand years ago, we have what is a lightning rod in order to stop lightning from damaging property. Amazing. It's all in the Torah. Beautiful. Okay, batting next is Rabbi Yonatan Evshitz. He passed away in 1764, about 260 years ago. In his book, Tiferet Yonatan, on page 20, in the portion of Noah, listen to what he says, an amazing Torah. He says that the idea of the tower 
was to be used. The tower was to be used as a launching pad to reach galaxies, moon, life beyond our existence, our knowledge. Can you get this? These amazing. What kind? We talked about the tower. This was high tech. Amazing sophistication. A spaceship, sort of. Or a launching pad, he says, or a spaceship to reach the moon or above galaxies. That was the idea. Next, third piece of new information. The Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda of Berlin, in his commentary on the Torah, called Haemek Davar, he writes, Noah 11.4, the tower was a center of AI. That's not his words, of course. I'm, those are my words. He writes, this was a center of intelligence. This tower was a center of intelligence to rule and control the world. Those that dared to think differently than the leaders, Nimrod, the King Nimrod, and other leaders of the generation of the tower, they would be executed. This was their center of intelligence, AI, artificial intelligence. Ain't new. Amazing. This tower was to spy and keep and and keep abreast of what everyone was thinking about, what, what they were talking about, ideas, etc. to make sure that nobody, there would be no one that would disagree with the rulers. So that's the unbelievable Emek HaNatsiv. Next, this one, a source from the Zohar Kadosh in the book of Noah, page 76a. Listen to this. King Nimrod, he found a holy book full of God's names, different names of God belonging to Adam, the original Adam. King Nimrod used this book that was originally, belo originally belonged to Adam and Eve, and it contained various ways to scramble and to, and to put together names of God in order to create various realities. That's how this amazing, sophisticated, high-tech was created. It was created through the holy names of God, according to the Zohar Kadosh, used for impure purposes, of course. Point number five. This is the Ben Yehoiada on his commentary to Sanhedrin, tractate Sanhedrin, 
106, side B. In an amazing, listen to these words that he says. I summarize. Folks, you can't make any of this stuff up. Amazing. If we understand what Nimrod, if we understand the generation of the tower, the tower and Nimrod and the generation and their battle against God, if we understand that, we understand today, Gogu Magog, we understand Armageddon. Listen to his words. This flying tower that Nimrod created, this was based on the knowledge of flying. Knowledge of flying. Planes. At the time, at the time of this tower, this knowledge was known and later forgotten for generations and generations and generations. He says straight out, planes. In Europe, this technology was reintroduced, but our forefathers in the Torah, in the, in the Tanakh, they knew this technology of how spaceship planes into the sky. That was the tower. Next, sixth point. According to the Ramak, Rav Moshe Cordovero, this is brought down by the book Torat Natan on page 153. He brings down the words of the Ramak. Amazing. Listen to these words. Listen closely. We spoke about in the beginning when it says in Genesis that God created light. We're not talking about the moon. We're not talking about stars. We're not talking about the sun. We're talking about a spiritual light which contained all secrets, all knowledge, all wisdom, health, science, biology, technology that one needs. And then, after a short period of time, there's different opinions which we discuss in the first class. We will not go over them. God removed that light. But we said it still exists for individuals or for communities. And listen, amazing. This first light of knowledge that you were able to see from one side of the world. You were able to see everything that is occurring in the world from one side to the other, east, west, south, and west, south and north. Today, you go on computer, Skype, whatever, satellites. This is what he says. This is on page 153. This light that was somewhat fixed in the time of Noah and his family by their spirituality, by their righteousness, they were able to bring back this light, this first light, back to the world. And this was used this was used by no, none other than Nimrod in order, in order to build this tower. So he had, he was privy to this first light, to a certain degree of this first light. Amazing! But folks, it, it even goes like, we're hidden out of the park today. 
It goes further. Our next source. God gave a coat to Adam. Some opinion is before when he was created, some opinion after he was created. It was a certain coat. What was this coat? In the book, in the book Shma'atin, on page 102, volume 8, Here's what he writes. Nimrod received the coat of light of Adam and passed down later to Noah. He used this powerful coat to rule over the world. This coat contained that first light. This coat. Now we could better understand there's an amazing words of our sages. It's in Breshit Rabbah 20, chapter 20, paragraph 29. It says, and this idea also is based on Pirkei de Rabbi Ezer, chapter 24. It says that in the Torah, in the writings of Rabbi Meir, doesn't mean that in the scroll itself, but he had his notes. Rabbi Meir had his notes. Rabbi, Rabbi Meir, who did tremendous miracles, Balanes. It says in his writings, in his summar summarizations of his Torah learning, it was written that God created after the sin of Adam and Eve, God created a coat of light, not light being Aleph Vav Resh, not what, it, what we see in our scrolls. It says Ayin Vav Resh, which means the leather or skins, a coat of skins. But in the Torah, in the notes of Rabbi Meir, it did not use the leathers or the skins, the ayin, it uses the aleph. This was a coat of the first light, and that's why it says that he was a great hunter. How was he such a great hunter? What, what makes one person a better hunter than the next? So what made him such a great hunter was he had that coat, and that coat put the fear of God into the animals. So of course, they just surrendered to Nimrod. So he was like considered to be the hunter of the world. Thank you, the coat, the coat of Adam, the coat of Noah, passed down afterwards, after Noah, to Nimrod. Nimrod used this coat and the light and the knowledge and the technology and everything we said about this first light. He used it in his war against God. And he aimed to create a dynasty of chosen men instead. There was a certain elite group, once again, if you remember, that they utilized the masses in order to forward their progression. They promised, just like in all the isms throughout all of history, when they promised the masses that their life would be improved. What we sing today, uh, we're seeing Democrat, the Democrat Party utilizing the Black Lives Matter, utilizing them only to be thrown away in the trash bin later on. Useful idiots. So they wanted an elite group of people to run, lead, live in the world. This was their war against God.
an amazing lesson by Rabbi Shimshon Pinkus of blessed memory. He was killed in a car accident about 15 years ago. Him, his wife, and his daughter. An amazing uh, scholar, an amazing righteous person. He writes in his book, Commentary on the Torah, Tiferet Torah, on page 208, an amazing thing. Listen to his words. It's really worthwhile to check out. He has about two pages on this subject. We don't have the time to delve into it, but it really is worthwhile. He shows the demise of the world of man. He shows how close that originally, that just like God's day is considered to be 1,000 years, the Torah tell us, tells us. A one day of God is our thousand years. If you notice, in the first generations of men, people lived almost to 1,000 years. That's how close we were to be godly. We were likened to God. We were in the image of God. But then, you see, the lifespan goes way down. Way down. So listen to this. In the time of Nimrod, Nimrod was only one of a few people that retained the image of God. This is how he was able to fight against God. You know, you hear a lot of people they're talking about how man was created in the image of God. This is true, but which man are we talking about? Not all men. We're talking about the first, Adam. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. But if you look, for example, in last week's portion, in last week's portion in the, uh, of the spies, it says very clearly that their image this special image, Tselem, Elohim, has disappeared from the nations. Check it out. Sar Tzilam. We have nothing to fear because they have lost. It's not a carte blanche. It's not something that it's, you're guaranteed that you carry it for the rest of your life. There are divisions. That's not our purpose right now. It says about the Jewish people that the Jewish people are considered to be Adam. That's what we're talking about. This image of God. Adam. Image of God. So, most people lost it. Most people lost it because of their evil deeds. You don't just you don't just do every sin in the book, transgression in the book, and you keep it. Huh, do, doesn't work like that. So Nimrod was one of the few people that he had this image of God still. Most of the people in his generation no longer had it. It was destroyed when they destroyed their characteristic traits, purity, their holiness. We go on. Listen to this. In the Rama of Pano, in his book Asarama Marot, the ten, ten forms of speech, he writes an amazing thing. Listen to this. Clean out your ears, listen, amazing stuff. This coat that God created for Adam, this coat was the soul of Adam. You heard that correctly. According to the Kabbalist, the Rama of Pano, Amazing! This coat gave a person the image of God. 
Tzelem Elohim. And therefore, the animals were terrified. People were terrified. Whoever would go with this code of Adam, it would put the fear of God into their hearts. This is... This is the soul of a person. When it says the image of God, we're talking about the soul. And that was via, through this coat. So therefore, Nimrod, whatever he did, this is brought down, whatever he did, he had this coat. He inherited it from Noah. So think about what he was able to do, his progression, high tech. Or in the words of the book, Le'om Koshal Mikra, the depths, depths of our Torah, on page 241. Listen to the words. This, this coat of light, remember we said, was it a coat of skin, leather, or was it a coat of light? This coat of light that, that Adam received from God, Nimrod took from Noah this coat gave so to speak royal authority to rule the world a godlike attribute remember in our second class was he a god many people considered Nimrod to be a god people bowed down to him This is an amazing thing. The original, in the original creation, people were so close to godliness. A thousand, they lived a thousand years almost. One day of God is, is a thousand years. They were so close. This coat, it gave them godly powers utilized for terrible sins and transgressions it was so dangerous when you have such a powerful tool in the hands of fools and knaves it is so dangerous like the atomic bomb what good things atomic energy can do to the world but if it's in the wrong hands it could destroy the world in a matter of seconds Nimrod he had still this image of God he had this coat he was so close to God he had godly so to speak godly powers what did he do with it? Almost destroyed the world. Almost destroyed the, the world. Using it for evil. Okay. Concluding points on Nimrod. Point number one, Nimrod, he was from the Nephilim. This is according to the book Chemdata Yamim, on uh, chapter of Noah, page 44. The Nephilim, just to remind ourselves, it means falling, because they, so to speak, fell from the sky. There was a big accusation against the human 
human race by the angels, especially two angels. And they wanted God to destroy you, mankind and in, instead let the angels take over. So God told them that if they were in our shoes, if the angels were in our shoes with all of the evil inclination that we have, with all of our tests, with all of our weaknesses that we have, because we are flesh and blood, they would even fall faster than mankind. So God sent two angels, and sure enough, if you didn't understand that, it's sure enough, in my hood, if you didn't understand that, in my neighborhood, that's how they said it. They didn't say sure enough, it was show enough. So they began to have relations with human beings, and from these relations came these giants. Nimrod was one of these sort of half breed. It's not a song by Cher. Half breed, it's all I ever hear. Half breed. No, it's, it's not the Cher song. Uh, half angel and half man. That's a lot of, lot of power there. And then, in an amazing line by the Al Sheikh commentator on Noah 11.4, he says an amazing thing. What was the battle Nemo was fighting against when he had this tower and he had this valley? What was, he, what was the battle? Listen, amazing. The battle was against Jerusalem and against the temple. Now that sounds like, one second, in the time of Nimrod, there was no temple. And there was no, there's no Beit HaMikdash. So what does this mean? We will get back to this. We will get back to this. He knew, once again, remember, Nimrod is not your average bear. Nimrod is a very, very spiritual person. He is wearing the coat of the first light. He is able to see into the future, from one side of the world to the next. He sees the deal. He sees the temple. He sees Jerusalem. He sees what it means. And that was his fight. His fight was not necessarily only for today. It was also for tomorrow and the next day and the next years and the next centuries to come. So he had this perception. That was his fight. Not only that, even on a more simplistic level, we said, who was the reincarnation of Nimrod? We had uh, Sancharib, king of Assyria. We have Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, Babel, of Babylonia, who destroyed the first temple. So it's the same person, it's the same soul, just reincarnated. So they're all going. Uh, the king of Assyria, Sancharib, he went, you know, to destroy Jerusalem. He failed, but they all have the same agenda and that is there is a war between there is a world war between Jerusalem the temple and these individuals and nations the Megalea Mukot he writes in Breshi in Genesis portion of Noah that Gogu Magog Armageddon will be, once again, Nimrod, it's all in one, Nimrod, Sancharif, and Nebuchadnezzar, all in one, that's who they are. Next, concluding about our tower, other commentaries that say that this tower was a flying spaceship. It was in the air. Aviation. These are, for example, the following commentaries. Livnata Sapir. One. Two. Perush Menachem. Three. The Zohar Kadosh. We mentioned where it was. Four. 
Rabbi Nehorai Gaon, that is in Tractate Sanhedrin 106, side B. Interesting enough that not only are these three, Nimrod, San Kharib, and Nebuchadnezzar, they're really one person, just reincarnated. Very interesting. Three of them, Torah tells us that these three ruled over Nineveh, which was a town in uh, today's Iraq. They both, all three of them ruled in the same place. Amazing. All three of them ruled in the same exact place. Today's Iraq. Not only that, all three of them proclaimed themselves to be God. You got it. Nimrod, Sancharif, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar. They all proclaimed uh, to be gods. This could be found in Tractate Chulin, page 89, side A. Okay, so we are going to, for our first class, uh, actually third part here today, we'll call a timeout, and God willing, we will be 